and welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.22 for Saturday, July 26th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always, my beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham. You'll be your hosts for this episode. Now, we're going to have Dave Mastin coming up from Mastin Space Systems in the second show. We're going to have some space news first in this first segment, second part of the show, not the second yep. show. <laughs> Like, we're, how many shows are we doing today, We're doing ben? about five shows. Okay. It's going to be awesome. That's great. Uh, but before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to the uh, patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this specific segment of this show go. These are the people who have uh, contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. Once again, this list is getting longer. Huge thank you to absolutely everyone. We've reached our next Patreon goal. Uh, we're, we're really starting to get up there, and it's going to be exciting with some of the things that we're able to do. We are a crowdfunded show, so every single dollar helps. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some space news. First up, <clears throat> this is just awesome. Yeah. SpaceX is looking to make uh, rockets recoverable mm -hmm. so that you you launch it up into space you recover as much of the rocket as you can instead of throwing the whole thing into the ocean hopefully radically reducing the cost of space flight well what you're about to see is a first stage of a falcon 9 coming back down over the ocean mm -hmm. extending its landing legs and then plopping into the ocean gracefully here check this out i don't think there's any sound with this I so like you said plopping gracefully because plop uh, like so i'll make I'll, I'll, I'll make engine noises you like yeah, so this is, these are the, uh, <laughs> thank, thank Okay, you. that's what it actually sounds like, though. <laughs> sure, yeah. I don't know. I'm not with the stage when it's coming back down. <laughs> so these are the engines relighting as it comes back down. So it's, it's engines first coming down. So amazing. Yeah. So you can see, as the little thing says, yeah. ice is now forming on the land, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, it will kind of, uh, ice and soot. I, I don't think they wanted to say soot because it is a uh, RP-1 uh, and then if you watch really carefully through all the soot and gook, you can actually see two of the four landing legs extend kind of in this next section. So we've got the center engine burning. And then in a moment, do it. There we go. Uh, Boom. Bam. Two of the four legs extend. And now what it's going to do is it's going to basically, uh, you can see it actually, there's the engine kind of going right over the ocean. It, the ocean is then going to help put out the engine. The whole vehicle is going to topple over onto its side. And that's bad for rockets when they topple in the ocean. Generally not designed to do that. Although the solid rocket booster of the space shuttle, they could topple. They could go in and go yeah. whack. That's a, if you're interested in seeing something else that went up to space and got recovered like mm -hmm. that, the solid segments of the space shuttle did something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had parachutes and they would come back yeah. down. And yeah. they they had cameras mounted on the side. And you can actually hit YouTube and watch that. Somebody in the chat room says, that the legs look a bit floppy and then somebody else responds with actually uh it was just the first stage screaming out Woo <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, uh that is a really cool uh video and then one of the next steps necessary to get a reusable first stage for falcon and uh, they're getting a little bit further and further along hopefully sometime soon they'll be able to do that on land which would be even more dramatic <sighs> one way or another it will be even more dramatic so uh, all right, we actually had a launch this last week. A Progress oh. launched a Boyd a Soyuz rocket. <laughs> Check it out. Part of me loves that these engines are so powerful that they basically, the sensor on the CMOS cameras goes berserk due yeah. to all of the vibration. Uh, I, it's just, it's really cool for me to see that. And, and yeah. You know, this footage in particular, but I, a lot of, a lot of launches, but for some reason, this footage right here in particular is so cinematic to me. Hmm. There's something like, you get a little bit of the color from the flame and you just, I don't know, it's just, it's so beautiful. So this launched Wednesday, July 23rd at 2144 Universal Time from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. This was a Progress vehicle, is the M24M. Goes up to the International Space Station. They launch a bunch of these bad boys. Progress mm -hmm. isn't designed to come back. I mean, it does come back. It just comes back in a bunch of pieces. <laughs> pieces. Uh, it gets uh, ripped apart in the atmosphere, so they'll uh, put garbage back on the vehicle when it's done. But mm -hmm. going up to the space station, it was about 1,764 pounds of propellant. 926 pounds of water, 57 pounds of air, and 48 pounds of oxygen, plus an additional 29 
Um, sorry, 29,000, 2,910, that would be impressive. Wow. 2,910 pounds of supplies, spare parts, and experimental hardware. And then this was one of those fast approaches to the space station. Nice. So instead of taking three days, it actually docked to the space station, I'm sorry, birthed to the space station a little bit later on at 0331 universal time. Very nice. And uh, yeah, so uh, there you go. That happened this last week. And uh, <laughs> speaking of, happened. so this last show, the last show that we had, we yes. talked about uh, a Soyuz launched the Photon M4 mm -hmm. spacecraft mm -hmm. uh, up and it had some geckos on board. Yes. It was going to be a long duration, like a two month experiment mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was pretty cool because the M4 is a vehicle that can go up into space and then detach and then send experiments back. Right. Cool. Kind of like a miniature portable space station for a little while. Ooh. Right? A little observation lab. Oh, a little mini me. Little, little mini me with little geckos running around. Oh. However, uh, after a few orbits, uh, Roscosmos lost communication with the uh, the yeah, I know <laughs> with the Photon M4 spacecraft. Sad. They were still getting telemetry down from the vehicle, but they couldn't send commanding up to the vehicle, right. and that was a problem because it was supposed to do a burn to put it into a proper orbit, but it didn't perform the burn. And then they couldn't talk to the vehicle. Oh. Well, as of a few hours ago, uh, they were able to reestablish a connection at 0405 Universal Time today. A connection has been reestablished. Now, hopefully, they'll be able to command the vehicle to perform that second burn. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't perform the burn, the atmospheric drag in the vehicle will likely pull it back in, and it will end. Yeah, I know. Poor geckos. Poor geckos. Uh, but if they are able to command the vehicle to burn and figure out what actually had happened, uh, then they'll, the experiment should be able to continue on as it was supposed to for the next few months, and then it's like uh, sexually charged geckos in space. Nice. That's pretty much what it is. Well, it's what... Everything about this story is really weird. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> like, now that I think about it, it's really weird. Uh, moving to, <laughs> let's move to future space flight a little bit. Dream Chaser from Sierra Nevada. Uh, actually, Dutta, you can just roll this animation because it's, it's kind of, if you miss the space shuttle, this is once speaking of Mini Me, it's like a, <laughs> well, yep. it's like a Mini Me space shuttle. Launches a top, it will launch a top an Atlas V rocket, maybe. And, um, uh, they have recently passed a new CCI cap milestone. Uh, CCI cap is basically the uh, how would I describe this? Because I, I just use an acronym and that's a no no. Yeah. Uh, it's it's basically the funding level for crude. Uh, it's a crude competition funding level from NASA. So NASA said, hey, we want some private companies mm -hmm. to send crew up to the International Space Station under this program called CCI cap, and. Um, that's what this is. So uh, they had milestone nine, which puts them at about uh, 92 percentage uh, of this uh, through from a paid standpoint. So mm -hmm. about 92 percent paid for their contract. And what milestone nine did was made five major system reviews: crew, environmental structures, structures, thermal control, and thermal protection. The two being slightly different, so thermal protection being on the bottom of the vehicle, right. thermal control being, you know, all of the like, avionics giving off heat and humans giving off heat and what the heck you're going to do with all that. So you're looking at an uh, animation of the flight profile of this bad boy, and it's designed to go up to the International Space Station, um, and it, it, so it launches vertically and lands horizontally, which is um, hands down the most elegant way to do things. Um, I would say uh, <laughs> vertical takeoff and horizontal landing is absolutely the future of absolutely everything. Yeah, I, I would say that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Someone's coughing in the background. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's cool that they're this far along. Now, there's a possibility that NASA's going to have to down-select because we've got Sierra Nevada, uh, we've got SpaceX, and then we've got the Boeing. Uh, it's Boeing with CST-100, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so... Uh, it's a possibility that NASA will be forced to choose only one of these providers based on available funding, which kind of defeats the point of the whole program. A little bit. Right, because you want competition. You right. want multiple companies. And then if something goes wrong with one vehicle, you've always got a backup. That's kind of the idea behind the whole thing. Right. But they may be forced to because they may not have the budget to do the whole thing. So 92% uh, of the way there. Congratulations to Sierra Nevada for doing that. Sure. And that was actually a huge milestone because that's a lot of systems that they had to test through for all of that. Speaking of next generation vehicles, how about the space launch system? So last week or the week before, sometime in the not too distant past. Yes. In in the not too distant yesterday, we talked about the space launch system, how they were on track and on budget. And um, this last week, the government accountability office said, uh, not so fast. We don't think so. Uh, they're, they're actually so. This is a shot of uh, an animation of what uh, SLS will look like. That uh, we're going to start with a 70 metric ton. 
uh, lifting to orbit, and it goes up to 120 metric ton. Is that right? 110? Anyone? 130, 130 metric ton is there somewhere in there. So that's the uh, block two would be the 130. But we're only talking about the 70 metric ton vehicle right now. GAO basically said um, they're off by about 400 million. So they're 400 million dollars short of what the program needs in order to launch by the 20 December 2017 target date. Uh, it, they also said the programs do not establish an ex executable business case that matches requirements, which I find to be interesting because it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like there are a lot, there's like no destination for SLS. So it's right. hard to build requirements for it other than be on time and on budget, but all right. You, which apparently they're not doing either. Uh, the development schedule of the core stage, which is what drives the SLS schedule itself, is compressed already to meet that 2017 timeline. And so kind of poking and prodding at a few NASA people, while they won't actually say that they're not launching in 2017, they probably won't say that until next year. Right. None of them actually believe that they're launching in 2017 at this point. So it sounds yeah. like they are in fact behind schedule. The GAO recommends that NASA develop an executable business case for the space launch system that matches resources to requirements. Oh. And that was a quote, if you couldn't tell. So direct wow. quote, resources to requirements. In other words, uh, what the heck are you doing here, guys? Uh, Somebody yeah. in the chat room says, does SLS have any not problems? Like, well, is there it's not like they were going so well for such a long time. Right. Well, and then somebody, uh, BZ Wing Zero, in the chat room responds with, well, they decided on a paint job. <laughs> well, they did have to change it from the old Aries 5 paint job <laughs> to the new SLS paint job, which went from that kind of brown or uh, orange to white. Yes. Orange to white. Make it look a little more Apollo-like. Apollo, right? exactly. Yes, more very Apollo -like, more Apollo-like. Um, all right. You had one last thing, which was the Ooh. next giant leap panel. Yeah, I just I just wanted to give a quick mention. Uh, it's probably one of those things that you're not going to see anywhere other than some maybe somebody covering it who was actually there. Uh, but for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, the San Diego Comic Con is going on this weekend. So it's Nerds. going on right now uh, in San Diego. Of course, it's one of the biggest Comic Cons that we have here in America, uh, although there are many that go on. And uh, one really cool panel that was there on Thursday, I believe, at noon, if I remember correctly, was a NASA panel. It was actually uh, monitored monitored moderated moderated that's what i want by seth green huh. and uh and a bunch of nasa people like buzz aldrin and uh mohawk guy and the planetary sciences guy that they at nasa has uh jim i forget his last name i want to say green or gruen anyway uh but i just thought that that was really cool that something like that i think you know if you go back 10 years even five years three years two years right you wouldn't expect to see a panel a nasa panel about sure. real science being at something like a comic con yeah and i think what's happening is people are starting to get excited about space again mm -hmm. because we we kind of became bored with it in the shuttle era because it became you know just whatever it was and it was un it was unachievable to mere mortals right. right and it was fairly reliable at the time I, I mean arguably but fairly reliable and it just kept happening and people didn't see what the benefit was right. now you have uh spaces spacex's of the world you have the mass and space systems of the world you used to have the armadillo aerospaces of the world you've got x core you've got virgin galactic and st suddenly you can start to see it kind of trickling into something that right. can impact you and suddenly you care a lot about it more and it kind mm -hmm. of is at your forefront a little bit more and i mm -hmm. think it I think it's uh, easier for people to relate to now. Yeah, I, I just thought it was really cool. And uh, so if you happen to see any coverage of it, you know, please read up on it. It My understanding is that the room was full. Uh, oh, they cool. actually had to turn people away, which is also really cool. That's a bummer that they had to turn people away. That kind of sucks. That's sort of how Comic Con is, though. If you don't, if you don't get in, like that's it, and then you have to be turned away, and it's not rebroadcast anywhere. It's not broadcast anywhere at all, um, and that sort of thing. But uh, I don't know. I, I thought that was a cool thing, and I just wanted to, you know. Right, cool. talk about it. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be bringing on Dave Mastin of Mastin Space Systems to talk about uh, everything that he's got going on. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
and welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started in talking to Sir Dave Mastin, I'd like to thank all the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific, specific segment of Tomorrow happen. These are all the patrons who have contributed at least $5 to this specific episode. And if you'd like more information on how you can help make these episodes happen week after week, go to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Now, I'd like to welcome Dave Mastin to our set. It's been a while since you were here. You were actually here when we were uh, directly to your left, not that anyone can tell, um, <laughs> using, like, webcams and just, like, whatever we could hobble together. So uh, it's been a little while since you've been yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so welcome back, first off. And for anyone who's new, could you describe who Mastin Space Systems is for us? So Mastin Space Systems is a little company I started ten, over 10 years ago now. Oh, wow. Um, to develop reusable uh, rockets to uh, lower the, the cost of access to space and and provide transportation services throughout the solar system. Uh, we've been working on this for 10 years now. We've developed, I don't know how many generations of engines, um, and we are now uh, flying our fourth reusable launch vehicle. So... Is that the one that you're using for DARPA? So or is that a different? No, no. DARPA is a is a is a design and development contract. All right. So let's talk about your your fourth vehicle first, which is what? That's that it is called Zero B, mm -hmm. and it is actually the direct descendant of our former Zero. Um, may she rest in peace. Um, but it's it's basically a, a simple suborbital vehicle tests out the ability to go supersonic mm -hmm. and control itself in flight. Uh, with some with aerodynamic control surfaces, not just the rocket engine gimbling. Um, because you know we got to turn off the rocket engine at some point and and fly through the air. So that's, that is going to happen. Is this also doing the autonomous landing as well? Yes. Yes. So, so we're still doing autonomous landing. And that's yes. kind of a big deal. I don't think many others are really doing that. Could you describe what you're doing with autonomous landing and so, what that even means? So yeah. So uh, going back to the uh, earlier um, comments about horizontal landing and all that. <laughs> Just to um, poke at you. Just to poke at you. <laughs> yeah. So we're actually landing vertically. I mean, it's it's you know come in, look, pretend my Mountain Dew can is a rocket. Mm -hmm. um, I I wish. Pepsi would sponsor us and make it. <laughs> Pepsi, here's an idea. <laughs> um, you know, come in and land vertically and uh, land on a dime, basically. We land regularly within less than an inch um, oh, wow. of, where we're, of where we're targeting. So now our, our current problem is, of course, we land with less than an inch, but we have a little bit of bounce in our landing gear. So, we, you know, we end up six inches away from where we Imperial are. units, really, Dave? Imperial units? I can use any any units you want to use, but uh, <laughs> most people understand the Imperial units better than the SI units. <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, our navigation is capable of, of remaining within two centimeters. But it's not just it's not just pinpointing your landing, which which is important, especially if you're trying to bring uh, something large. Like, you look at Falcon 9, that's a big, huge gas tank with lots of very hazardous materials on them. You got, yes. You've got fuel and uh, oxidizer still in mass on that vehicle. If it comes down and it's way off, that's bad. That would be true of your vehicles as well. So, well, no, I mean, yeah, smaller, we, smaller. You know, I mean, our vehicles are smaller, but um, yeah, I mean, the, the pinpoint landing uh, gives us some advantages in that, you know, you can say, hey, you are going to land on this flat concrete pad instead of landing on you know, the brush in the desert or... But that's where your autonomous or... stuff is cool because if it goes, actually, that's not a flat concrete pad, you can, your vehicle can make real-time decisions without the ground. Yes, yes. And, um, actually, uh, we did uh, uh, some press releases. I'm not sure it really came out in the press release very well. The um, We did some recent flights for Astrobotic, one of the JLXP teams, mm -hmm. and we actually flew an algorithm on board that said if Astrobotic... Astrobotic was picking... A landing site mm -hmm. based on on what it's doing. I mean, it's the test. It's saying, "Hey, scan the ground. What is where is a safe place to land? That's where we want to land." We actually were also running an algorithm to keep our vehicle safe, saying, "Is you know we know what the good landing spots are," mm -hmm. um, and then we have a guidance algorithm saying, "Okay, if I accept what where Astrobotics uh, device told us to go." Can I generate a trajectory to get to that point in real time while I'm f screaming through the air? 
about ready to hit the ground, can I suddenly adjust my trajectory, calculate a new trajectory, and, and, and touch down on that point? Can you translate that same technology to somewhere like Mars, right? Because you look. Yes. Let's, let's use Apollo 11 as an example, right? So that, 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 that it's actually we did our own implementation of stuff we tested for JPL, which is very similar, and JPL is testing that out for Mars. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of, hey, we're coming in. You know, when you're at Mars, when you're coming into Mars, you don't have a GPS system, mm -hmm. and so they they start taking pictures. They start doing the terrain relative navigation. And again, it's just like with Astrobotic, uh, all of these groups are, are doing pretty much the same thing. Okay, where, where are we in reality? You know, our IMU is going to give us one answer. We're gonna take a picture of the ground and we match the picture of, of the ground to the pictures in, that we've got in memory. Um, and we're going to make some adjustments and, and take out the error. Mm -hmm. But we're still gonna have some error, right? And so then, based on that, create our new a new trajectory in real time. Um, you know, previous previous every previous mission, trajectory generation is something you did back on Earth years in advance. And if you're off even by a little bit. And then yeah, and, and don't you dare be off by a little bit. <laughs> well, actually, you can be off by a little bit because you just had to make sure that your trajectory was could be off by a little bit. And you'd still be okay. So that actually, but that creates a, huge landing ellipses, and now you have to choose. Like curiosity, right? It had to land yeah. in this huge flat area and then drive for what was it? A year? It's, had to drive for like a better part of a year. Driving and driving and driving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to, to get exactly. to its actual site that it wanted to be at with your software, in theory, on paper, it'd be able to go. Okay, well, actually, we can get much closer to the landing site because we narrow that down to a much smaller range, and we can make real time yes. decisions. Yes. So yeah, with with our software, with JPL. Uh, with Astrobotic, we're all working on very similar stuff, and yeah, it's all down to, yeah, we can pretty much just choose where we want to land, and if it's in a crater, or you know, in a ravine, we can do that. Yeah, I brought up Apollo 11 as an example because they had that problem, right? So they went to land, and uh, Neil Armstrong noticed, oh, we can't land where they said we were going to land, but in that situation, they had a human that could take control. But if you're yes. sending robots to Mars, there is no human that could take control because the latency between Earth and Mars is at minimum, it's minimum, what, seven minutes, nine minutes? Yes. At, it, at yes. its closest, yeah. and it gets longer from there. So by that time, you've already gone through your entry, descent, and landing phase, and you've, you've, you've <laughs> yeah, hit a crater. Yeah, 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 seven minutes of terror. Yeah. It's, it's uh, seven minutes for a number of reasons, um, including the, the physics of, of, of communication. But yeah, it's, but we can, yeah, we can just, you know, Basically, we can take out any errors. We can see in real time what's going on, and you know, make that make that slight adjustment to, to land someplace safe. All right, so that's what you've got today. What about in the future? We briefly touched on DARPA. What's going on with the the DARPA so, award? DARPA is is probably our, our big opportunity here. This is something that we've been wanting to do for a very long time, actually. Um, it's a much larger vehicle than what we've done in the past. How much larger? Uh, so our existing vehicles, I think our tallest vehicle um, with everything stacked up is 15 or 16 foot tall. Um, the vehicle we proposed for the DARPA program is around 70 foot tall. Wow, so a lot larger. So much larger, it's about the same size as, as a modern fighter jet, an F-15 or an F-22, something like that. Tipped up. Um, but yeah, tip it up. Um, yes, it has wings. Um, actually, we prefer to call them things. Um, <laughs> things. Maybe things. Yeah, big fins. Um, and uh, but yeah, we're we're designing a vehicle for them. It's uh, you know our our biggest point. What we really hammered on the proposal was, you know, the requirements are ten flights in ten days super operable you have to be able to really be able to turn that thing around um, very minimal crew on it very low cost and I was like we've demonstrated all that we've already done that 10 flights in 10 days we did 12 flights in nine days for the lunar lander challenge but that's a much smaller vehicle but that is a much smaller vehicle. I mean, it doesn't scale uh, one to it one does. does it it does we okay. can scale. and it's not scaling one to one okay. it's scaling we don't change the size. So it doesn't of our scale. Crew. So it doesn't matter what size it is. We don't just... care what size it is. The the crew requirements we think we can make keep roughly the same 
and still scale up a vehicle. Doesn't your engine become much more complicated though? Um, engine will be a little more complicated, but we still, we, we already figured out, you know, what, what do we need to do to make that reusable and make it so that we don't have to take the engine off, tear it apart, rebuild it, put it back on. Instead, it's just, it's on there, it stays on there, and you know, after 100,000 miles, we'll take a look at it. Or, well, maybe not 100,000 miles, but after 100 <laughs> flights. <laughs> you know, going, well, I was, you know, looking at the car, you know, like a car every sure. every periodically, sure. you, you know, you you, check, you actually do some work on your engine, you know, air, aircraft every 100 hours. You have to take it in and have the, have the mechanics look at it. But, but yeah, and we're looking at something similar. After, after 100 flights, we'll take it in and maybe tear it down and take a close look at it. But otherwise, you know, it's going to be basic, simple, you know, clunk, clunk, clunk. Yeah, sounds about right. Okay, you're good to go. Did you expect it? I mean, are you becoming a propulsion company? Did you expect the, the so, engine to be as much of what it is? Well, we've always been something of a propulsion company. That was, we spent probably our first two, three years working on nothing but the engines. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because it's, it's, there aren't, reusable engines just aren't really available out there. Um, there is maybe, so there is one other reusable engine of the size that we would use on the DARPA XS1 program, and it's just way too expensive. Hmm. And that's the RL10 that is used on the Atlas V Centaur upper stage. Okay, yeah. It is an awesome engine. Unfortunately, rocket dying, aerojet, whatever, yep. they know how awesome it is, and <laughs> they know how... So they charge an arm and a leg and then some, and, and it's probably about 100 times more expensive than it should be. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it can be. Um, because it can be, but, yeah. so, but that actually the, um, you know, XS1, you know, DARPA says, you must design this vehicle to be built with only $140 million. And, but it's not just you guys doing, well. So that's the, that's the program requirements is the vehicle. Per, per vehicle, right? Design to build for $140 million. That's the DARPA requirement. All right. If you use an RL10, mm -hmm. you are not going to meet that budget requirement. Period. Straight so you up, need, you just will not meet that budget requirement. You need something else. So either in-house or you either, can't, right? Or I mean, either in-house or whatever. Uh, there is one other company that makes reusable rocket engines besides ourselves, that's mm -hmm. x -Core. Yep. Um, there are, well, actually, if you looked at the DARPA XS1 uh, uh, press release, it's Maston and x mm -hmm. So we're going to be using x for some propulsion bits. And they, they've they done that before. Well, they had the uh, rocket racers, the little... Uh... Yeah, and they've done, they've done engines for rocket racers and such. Yep. Um, now, we were actually doing this because DARPA did not want to spend money on a development, on an engine development program. Mm -hmm. We actually have x -Core and ourselves are both developing engines Interesting. to basically the same specs. Just whichever one works kind of thing? And whichever one, whichever one is working, whichever one pr provides the lowest risk for DARPA so that they don't have to spend a huge amount of money on an engine development program, mm -hmm. we, can, you know, we can figure out which one go is going to work out best. Is the engine the hardest part or is it all of it combined? What, what's... Um, it's all of it. The engine... I, I don't want to say it's the easiest part, mm -hmm. but it's it's its own problem because you need a, a reliable engine, um, and there aren't too many engines that are reusable. I was gonna say reli reliable and restartable yes. multiple times after yes. undergoing how fast the vehicle it has to go multiple mock, like Mach four. Um, so we're, uh, so the requirement is from the phase one requirement was to design a vehicle to Mach ten. Mach 10. So, to, to simplify that, you have to create a vehicle, a whole transport system, that will yes. be able to go to Mach 10, engine structures and all, come back, yes. land somehow. I don't think right. they care if you go horizontal or they, vertical. They, they do not care they how you land. They just want you to land, right? Just as long as you land. So you have to go from Mach 10 back to zero on land, and then within, uh, what was that, a 10-day time frame? 
Within 10 days, you have to do 10 flights. Right. So, so you essentially, on average, you have to turn around and do another flight within 24 hours. Once a day. And to put that into perspective, the space shuttle did something similar, except that it couldn't launch once per day on average. It took them, they had to refurbish the whole thing after every flight. I'm trying to remember. I don't uh, Maybe, maybe, maybe the folks in the, the chat room remember the, the fastest they turned around the shuttle was somewhere in the four to six week range. I didn't even realize it was that fast. Uh, they turned around a shuttle. In that must like have been fairly minutes. early in the program. Uh, actually, it was fairly late in the program. Really? Yeah, they, they made some huge strides after Columbia. Hmm. Um, just because they always had to have the, the second shuttle ready to go. Oh, yep. Oh, that makes sense. That was 54 days. 54 yeah. days, says the control room. So, so well, that's roughly 60 So you, you have to do a, a one, you have to improve it 54x, essentially from what the government has been able to do yes, historically. Yes, But, you know, we've already done that. We've already do 10 flights in 10 days. You know, like I said, we did 12 flights in 9 days. But you don't so, make it to Mach 10. Well, we don't make it to Mach 10. So, that the actually, the hard part, I think, is going to be the, uh, the thermal protection system. Hmm. Um, you know, we're going Mach 10. One of the things they, that DARPA wants us to look at is um, the ability to transfer this uh, vehicle into doing hypersonic testing for the Air Force be able to test scram jets and other hypersonic technologies. So that is going to create some interesting problems because that means they want us low in the atmosphere going Mach 10. So you have a lot of atmospheric soup to shoot through at Mach 10, so your structures have got to be... <laughs> so our structures are going to have to be pretty strong and our, our thermal protection system is going to have to be really good. <laughs> um, it's the hypersonic scram jet case. That is a really hard thing for it makes the it makes the shuttle's thermal protection system look like you know that oh just that's easy just you know go throw some carbon carbon on it and you're done it's not a problem it's not an issue compared to, to what you can do in, in all fairness though shuttle was made and designed essentially in the late 60s and 70s I mean I hope we have <laughs> progressed a little bit since then oh, we have we've progressed quite a bit um, but still it, it's yeah it's a, it I mean that is actually the Thermal protection system was one of the toughest parts of developing the shuttle. Um, thermal protection system has always been a very hard, difficult thing, and this hypersonic test bed work is even is just that much harder. It's that more much more difficult. So, and there's there's some there's there's plenty of room in in what DARPA is looking for that we might have some you know we can move stuff around and make things. Uh, there's a lot of trade-offs, and that's that's really what what we're doing for DARPA right now is, is figuring out all the trade-offs to how do we get them everything they want, mm -hmm. and and make it work. And uh, and like I said, you know, the thing we emphasize most for them is, you know, we already have the operations. We already have the, you know, all we have to do is figure out how to do this, the 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 rest of it. And we actually have, um, you know, the the press releases that have come out so far. I don't think any one of them has ever stated. You know that just about every one of us, the prime contractors were selected. We all have large teams behind us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a small company, but we still have a large team behind us. We've we've got uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs providing some supercomputer capabilities and some analysis capabilities that you know so you, no one else has in the world. So you get to play with supercomputers. I get to play with at least two of the largest supercomputers in the world. Oh, you poor thing. <laughs> oh, I'm so disappointed. Um, it's terrible. It's horrible. <laughs> you know, I, you need to set up at least like 10 minutes of extra time just to mine bitcoins for a while. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> Ooh. I know, right? <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Continue it on. You've got, you've got huge... So that, well, we, you know, we have an organization, uh, Materials Research and Development, a um, little company in Pennsylvania that... Uh, specializes in doing uh, thermal protection systems mm -hmm. um, and hot structures and, and stuff like that. So they're they're helping us with the uh, thermal protection systems work that we need to do. Um, you know, like we've already mentioned Xcor is helping us with some engine technologies, um, and then we you know we've got um, a, a group doing program management, so we can actually work with the government because. You work with the government. You got to have certain things in place, and you got to obey certain laws and regulations. Lots uh, of paperwork. And there's a whole bunch of paperwork that, uh, yeah, thankfully, we've got another company to do. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we actually have we actually have put together a fairly large team. I think is is 
um, can really bring this together and will you know yes a small company can make this work because we have this huge team behind us to, to really help us out through this. All right what I like to do is I like to take a quick break uh, and when we come yep. back we're gonna talk about that we had some questions from the community that uh, okay I'd like to ask you okay uh, so we'll ask those questions and uh, I think we'll shift a little bit to uh, some future based stuff so stay with us we'll be right back Welcome future patrons of Tomorrow. If you're not familiar with who Tomorrow is, we're a live weekly webcast about the cosmos and human exploration of the stars. We'll feature things like rocket launches, we'll have guest interviews, we'll have amazing conversations about the cosmos, and of course an interactive chat room so that you can not only talk with other like-minded cosmic explorers, but also us, the hosts of the show as well. And we're just generally excited about humans exploring space and we're here on patreon as a way to crowdfund the show itself because this isn't something that a normal network would pick up but it is something that a lot of us are really really excited about for those of you not familiar with patreon think of it like a recurring kickstarter a way for you to contribute to the show but on a per episode basis instead of just once you can contribute whatever amount you feel fit for these episodes but once you start hitting that $1 mark, we're going to start giving rewards back to you. At $1, you'll get your name in the credits. At $5, you'll get your name in the credits. Plus, you're going to get an exclusive Google Hangout. At $10, you get even more stuff. Contribute what you feel is fair. Now, you know what I said? This is on a per episode basis, and we do have more than one episode per month. So if you want to make sure that you don't spend too much money per month, you can set an upper level cap. For example, you can contribute $5 per episode, but no more than $25 per month. Or you can contribute $1 per episode, but no more than $10 per month, whatever fits your budget. And if you'd like to see where your crowdfunded contributions are going, check out our goals. We're always getting new equipment, we're trying to do cool new things with social media, we're trying to do some amazing things in this space, and each goal helps us get closer and closer to realizing one of those new things. With the help of you, our patrons, we can make this show truly something special. And let me be the first to welcome you to tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. I'd like to give a huge thank you to all the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this segment of tomorrow happen. These are the people who've contributed at least $3 or more to this specific episode. That's the t patron plus Community members, I think is what we call those guys. Uh, so anyone who's contributed $3 or more to this specific episode for this segment, uh, help them make it go. So a huge thank you to everyone. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. We are a crowdfunded show and every single dollar helps. We're still here with Dave Mastin of Mastin's, the CTO of Mastin Space Systems. And uh, we had some questions from the patrons. Actually, everyone at that $3 and above level has the ability to send in questions in advance for our guests. Uh, we'll Excellent. ask him on the air. So uh, the first question, well, it's not really a question. It's just Trent being weird. This is Quant He goes by Quantum Gene. He says, um, and I quote, I just want you to say, quote, things aren't what they used to be because you refer to them as things, not fins or wings, but things. Things, yeah. Things aren't what they used yep. to be when Dave explains how they've gotten rid of all the things, wings, on their XS1 vehicle, which I think refers to a tweet that you sent out. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a little tweet out. Yeah, we're uh, we're still designing the vehicle, so things are changing very rapidly. <laughs> things aren't what they used to be. As things are not what they used to be. Yeah. <laughs> All right, James says. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not James. Uh, Justin says, any chance we can get the total cost of development so far? Just a ballpark figure would suffice. Um, yeah. Uh, so out of pocket, eighty five hundred dollars. Uh, <laughs> The insurance company paid three hundred fifty thousand. Oh, I'm sorry. We're talking about the bionic back for <laughs> TIFF. Uh, that yeah, that bionic back has, has a rocket attach point, so you know we can we can do the jetpack. I you know I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened actually. For you know you know we'll talk. Can we talk about the bionic back in After Dark? Sure. All right. So we'll talk about that. If you don't know what the bionic back is, if you're a patron, uh, watch After Dark, and we'll talk about um, we'll, TIFF. Can we bring you on camera yeah, as well? Yeah. Oh yeah, it, it, it's it's amazing. I'm so. gonna show you scars if you want. <laughs> yeah, I mean there was there was no context. Justin gave us no context, so technically you yeah. did actually answer the question. Uh, no, so development cost. Uh, um, I don't know which uh, development cost you're looking for. Um, I think we're right around between ten and twelve million dollars uh, spent on developing rocket engines and rocket vehicles. Hmm. Um, 
over a period of 10 years. Uh, probably a little over that now. I don't know. Yeah, I'm for, I, you know, I, I'm now the CTO rather than the CEO for a very good reason. I don't do very well with counting the money. Um, I do much better with designing and saying, here's how we're going to hold the cost down um, and the, you know, the strength up. That's, that's what I do. So that's why I'm CTO now, not CEO. So You liking it more as CTO? So I'm I really I'm loving my job a whole hell of a lot better. Um, <laughs> you like making the things, not uh, I like I like making them. Yeah. I like I, I prefer to make them. Uh, definitely. Cool. All right, this comes from Chris Radcliffe. He says, "I'm probably late to the party, but the XS1, that's your DARPA vehicle, looks fundamentally different from previous Maston craft, specifically the plane part of the space plane." Does Maston plan to bring in a new people or partner with another company for that aspect of Zephyr? So yeah, that, that's I mean. And there you go. There's a, there's a picture of it, right? The the yeah. space plane. So Count wings. So yeah, notice notice up in the uh, corner there it says artist uh, artist concept. Um, so yeah, that's you know I'm gonna blame some artist. Um, <laughs> Silly artists. <laughs> don't know what they're doing. Silly artists. Don't know what they're doing. Just throw stuff together in cab. Make it look pretty. <laughs> um, no, actually, um, you know, the wings are, are that, you know, they're talking about low cost and needs to be reusable. And, and at the industry day, they actually talked about doing everything is just, you know, you take off from point A and you land somewhere downrange, which at Mach 10, um, they showed us some uh, different ranges. Um one of those was from Dugway Proving Ground in Utah to, um, where was it? I don't even recall where they flew to, but it actually overflew a couple major cities um, and, and landed maybe a thousand miles downrange. Um, and I looked at that and said, no, if we're going to meet the cost goals, you know, one of the cost goals is, is you got to be able to use this as a booster for a system that is going to launch a 3,000 pound satellite to, or five, from three to 5,000 pounds of satellite into orbit for a cost of less than $5 million. If I want to hold my cost down, I can't just land downrange because that means I need a whole second set of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I need launchers, I need people, I need a whole second crew of people to deal with it. Um, I can't, I'm not just flying once, I'm actually flying twice because once I get down range, I have to come back up range to get ready for the next one. Um, and, you know, so this all adds up and all of a sudden you're, 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 you're expensive again. Mm -hmm. So we have to, re so we want to return to the launch site. Well, you have to get back to the launch site somehow. So, you know, a little, a uh, little extra lift over, you know, the, the big ratio in airplanes is lift over drag. How, what's your L, D, L over D ratio? Um, the space shuttle is a brick at four and a half on approach uh, to landing. Um, typical, Falling brick with wings. Yeah, typical airliner is, is in the, the teens. Um, you know, you can get and you get into the gliders and sailplanes, and you're looking at you know thirty plus. Um, so you know we need something. Um, <laughs> My estimate for Falcon Niner is going to be it's going to have a lift to drag ratio of around one and a half, maybe, <laughs> maybe two. Um, well, it's it's a different it's a different vehicle, right? but it's a you know, it's a different vehicle. It has no wings. It's right. a cylinder, basically. Yep. And, and and you know, actually, if you you take a cylinder and you fly it at a, at a high a, a moderate angle of attack, mm -hmm. you're going to get a lift to drag ratio of around one and a half to two. So. Um, Depending on a whole bunch of things, there's you know tons of stuff. Aerodynamics is never easy, um, so with that caveat. But yeah, I, I figure somewhere between one and a half and two is, is what it'll have, and you know so well okay wings and you get a lift over drag of four, uh, so that's a glide ratio of four or no wings and have a glide ratio of two. Um, you, you might want to think about wings. Hmm. So yeah, we thought about it. <laughs> you have to, you know, it's just it's, it's, it's still in there. It's still a possibility. Um, well, it's a concept vehicle right now, right? So everything's so subject to change, right? Everything is subject to change. It's concept. It's actually I'm actually spending more time doing software engineering and making the computer tell me what the right answer is than I am actually designing. I'm not doing any mechanical engineering. I'm doing all all the uh, all software engineering. Do you like both sides of it, the software and the hardware side? So yeah, yeah, but what. I mean, our, our, our big insight, and, and actually, um, for the, if, if those of you, um, who, if any of you who are listening 
uh, watched uh, the um, or were present at the uh, recent New Space Conference, uh, Steve Jurvetson uh, yesterday was talking about what he liked so much about SpaceX and these other companies. It was actually there's a lot of software model to it because they're figuring out how to do how to replace the hardware engineering with software engineering. Hmm. And that's that's the thing. Where that's a lot of what I have been doing over the last several years is I'm actually writing software to do the hardware engineering. To oversimplify that, would you say it's like making uh, the aerospace industry more Silicon Valley? They're definitely making the and, and that's not oversimplifying it. That's that's why we're seeing I had tons. Uh, there's um, prior to just recently, prior to the new space um, conference, because it was being held, I, because I was talking there, and it was being held up in the Silicon Valley. I happened to stop and talk to a few people in the Silicon Valley, all of whom are doing something aerospace related and Silicon Valley startup. Hmm. So are we see, actually uh, riffing off that for a moment? Is there a resurgence of aerospace now because you can do a lot of this in software? Is is Silicon Valley grabbing onto this going, we can, you know, you look at Elon, Elon's other company, Tesla. He's like, we can do yeah. cars better. And so Silicon Valley took that and they made a better car. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. Arguably, right? Everyone's like, we, so is Silicon Valley going, aerospace, you were so stuck in the 60s, we can do this better. <laughs> Yeah, um, the, the recent uh, flock of CubeSats that was launched from the ISS not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, Planet Labs, I believe, is the mm -hmm. company that does that. Um, they are a Silicon Valley startup in every sense of the word. They were, were they, they were bought by Google by uh, for um, a billion or something like that? Um, is that is that, are we talking about the same I don't company? Know, I don't think it was Planet Labs. Maybe it was another. There was, but there was another one that was bought by there, Google there for was, an obscene yes, amount of money. There is... There is um, there, there is another company that built satellites that was just bought by Google. Is now a great time. Skybox. To That's the one. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, you the, the going joke is um, how do you become a millionaire in aerospace? You start off a billionaire. Yes, yes. Right. So is that still the case, or do you think it's, the, the industry is funny? I think it's starting shifting. to shift. I think it's starting to shift. I mean, I, I. So once again, you know, up in the Silicon Valley, I was talking to some investor types, and they're saying that they're. They think that even though SpaceX is privately held, if they were to go public, they would be worth now, if they went public, somewhere in the multi-billion dollars, hmm. um, that they could raise billions of dollars by going public. Well, that means that, you know, they're going to, from, you know, uh, Elon Musk put in like 100 million or something like that into SpaceX to get it going, and then took on uh, additional money from the Founders Fund or one of the other investment groups uh, that was worth about a hundred million or something like that, sure. and the rest of the money's been coming from customers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, all of a sudden, that's that's not a bad re rate of return. That's definitely not going from billionaire to millionaire. That's going from multi-millionaire to billionaire. Mm -hmm. So not bad, not bad at all. So uh, speaking of SpaceX, John Bernstead, uh, uh, another patron of Tomorrow, asked, "Did Maskin work with SpaceX?" on its grasshopper program. That's their reusable little jumping thing that goes up and down. <laughs> um, you know, Falcon Niner would be, uh, would be uh, returning to pads instead of uh, landing in the sea if they had been working with us. Oh, 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 snap. So the answer is no. No, you've not worked. So yeah, the answer is no. I, I wish they would have called me, at least called me and given me a chance. Can they, they still call you? Is there still uh, something absolutely, you can offer? Absolutely, absolutely. If they want to call us and, and find out what we're doing, uh, we're happy to talk. Especially if they're bringing a check to the table. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing with aerospace, right? It's all about. Yeah. Well, I think assume with any company, but with aerospace, you know, hardware costs are expensive, and what yep. you're doing is complicated, and that costs money. So, you know, money funneling into this industry is a good thing. Yes. Uh, and with Absolutely. with the Silicon Valley kind of mentality startup, does that just putting more money into the global industry and kind of all ships are rising with it, or is it just shifting the money around to another area? That's going to be a tough question to answer because so many times you start seeing stuff starting to boom. Yep. And then you find out that actually it was just everybody shuffling money back and forth between each other. Ah, yep. Rather than actually getting, actually creating value and bringing money in. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we're seeing some actual creation of value and starting to actually get money to come in from other, other places. Well, that's good. That's good. That's great for the uh, so industry. That is, that is excellent for the industry. I mean, well, I mean, for one thing, uh, we actually, you know, SpaceX now has on their launch manifest and is actually launching 
commercial satellites where that money would not have been coming into the United States at all. It would have been going to Ariane space, most likely. It would, yeah, Ariane space or going going to Russia mm-hmm. um, yeah, for a, a Dnepr or a, a Soyuz launch vehicle. Mm-hmm. And instead, those satellites are starting to come back to the United States. That's you know, that's money coming back into the, to the United States industrial base. Well, it used to be that way, right? It used to be that the United States was the de facto launcher for everything, yep. and then um, essentially ULA happened. Um, I mean, I'm not... I'm not so saying, actually, I'm just, it was before ULA happened. It was called ITAR. Oh, is it really? Was it really ITAR that did it? It was really ITAR. But if it, if it's it ITAR that did it, we still have ITAR. Um, ITAR hasn't gone away. It's been reformed a little bit, but not a lot. So that was sort of the the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm. Um, but there's a whole lot of other straws that needed to be fixed as well. So I mean, it's it's yeah, everything converged into commercial business went away from the United States. And now, you know, Elon Musk is, is the Falcon 9 is, come, is bringing it back. So we're not, I'm not supposed to use acronyms. So ITAR is the International uh, Trade of Arms uh, Regulations. International for, Trafficking, the trafficking of, of Arms, arms Regulations. Right, and that's basically, yeah, there you go. Um, it's, no one likes it. It's, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's just it's a colossally terrible. huge pain in the butt, and it makes pretty much anything you work on a weapon. And... Um, uh, Right, I mean, all your spacecraft... Every, like you everything in aerospace is a weapon. Right, so yeah. it, it has to be restricted. It's like restricted by the Department of Defense, and you can't talk about so, it. You can't take pictures of it. You can't... It, you, they make it really hard to work with people. We, we cannot... Yeah, we can't... I mean, we cannot even... We cannot talk to our GPS vendors. <laughs> it, it, the only thing we can say is, yes, we're using the GPS for aerospace purposes. That's it. Uh, if we have a problem with the GPS, we can't even ask any questions. <laughs> Yeah. Hopefully it'll go away or at least be reformed um, sometime soon. So there's a lot of work going on for reformation, so that's a good thing. All right. So uh, last question from the community. Uh, and I thought this was a really good one. I'd like to spend a little bit of time on it. And this comes from James Moore, also a patron of tomorrow. He says, what should be the goal? The moon again first uh, or Mars first? Are there resources to accomplish both? Should it be a business decision versus a government program? So basically he's saying, should we go to the moon? Should we go to Mars or should we do both? Okay, so the, the first question, should we go to the moon, should we go to Mars? Um, yes, we should go to both. Uh, what the goal should be, I'm going to suggest we go, we back up a little bit, and instead of saying, you know, what should the goal be, we'll say, how, what should the process be to determine what the goal is? Uh, this is crazy. Somebody who hates process and just wants to build things <laughs> is actually saying this, but we have a process for determining what the goal is. And that is, you know, some senator on the science committee um, in the Senate, or, you know, whatever committee is that handles science and NASA, um, basically says, I think this is going to be the goal. And they fight with the president, and the president fights back. And, and you know, every four years or eight years, everything changes up. And we're going to the moon. Wait, no, no, no. Now we're doing an asteroid. No, wait, wait, wait. No, two years left of the asteroid. Now we're going back to the moon. Yeah, so it, it's... How about we do it the way the science mission director it does it? Okay. Decadal survey. Who are the truly interested parties? Who are the leaders of those parties? Bring them together and figure out what are the goals for the next decade and how do we do it? Um, so, you know, for, for human exploration, I would imagine that you have scientists, just like for the, the science mission directorate's decadal survey, but then you're also going to have politicians because, let's face it, we've been using, you know, ever, ever since the announcement of Apollo, we have been using space, civil space, as a political tool mm-hmm. um, to deal with international policy. So Russia's therefore, are the Russian engines. We still have, we still are doing that. It, that is a major issue. Um, it is also a major, um, you know, potential really good thing as well as a bad thing. Um, so you know, there are policy, legitimate policy goals can be advanced through civil space. So therefore, you're going to have some have the policy wonks and the politicians, you know, on on this group figuring out the the Cato survey, and also the business leaders. You know, Elon Musk made it clear he wants to send 80,000 people or more or less to Mars and create a huge colony and start, you know, and start moving humanity off Earth. And I would love to go survey Elon Musk's retirement home. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I don't want to be the pioneer. I'm not a pioneer. I'm an explorer. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I want to go there, survey his retirement home. I'm going to return back here and retire here, but on Earth. But you know that's okay if he wants to uh, give him all the tools and <laughs> he can take his rockets and his eighty thousand people and they can go to Mars and. I'm going to keep rooting for him. <laughs> Terraform the heck out of it. But at any rate, I mean, that's, you know, we, okay, we've got myself and, and Elon at least are interested in, you know, how do we get to Mars? What, you know, maybe we should be inputting that into the decadal survey. Maybe we should be informing some opinion about what NASA's doing. So, yeah, there you go. There you've got scientists, politicians, and business leaders, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking, talking together and, and working out and doing things in a decadal survey fashion. And maybe that's how they should, you know, NASA should choose where to go next. Um, and then along those lines, NASA's strategy might be thinking more in terms of how do we just generate a whole bunch of capabilities so that whatever the decadal survey says, we're ready to go. So you're saying maybe NASA doesn't build the rockets, they build the infrastructure? They build the roads to Mars? Um, maybe they develop the technologies. Hmm. Maybe they do some technology development work, uh, more of a NACA model rather than the... the the Apollo model. So NACA being the agency before NASA. That's so again, the, yep. the getting rid of the acronyms here, uh, that would be... I, you know, I, I don't, don't remember what NACA stood for, do you? I don't. Uh, let's, let's, I'm going to look national, that up. Really. National Air Civil... The C is civil, I believe. Uh, now nah, I'm not going to be able to find it. Oh, wait. Uh, national Advisory Committee for Aeron Aeronautics, NACA. Okay, there we go. And it was prior to NASA. It was yes. before NASA was formed. NACA basically molded into NASA. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a, an excellent organization. It was, you know, really advanced aeronautics um, tremendously. Um, and basically industry said, hey, we need a wing that can do this. And NACA guys would work on it and, okay, here's what a wing profile that will do that it looks like. Hmm. Um, huge database of what air of airfoils and and all sorts of really good um, stuff from aer for aeronautics came out of NACA. Um, a lot of good research, and you know NASA NASA should be doing that as well, and NASA should be leading the exploration part as well. Um, you know, going out to the solar system. Hey, yeah, NASA has a role in, in leading that exploration. Um, doing the uh, things that don't make business sense today, but advance the country and humanity as a whole. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's 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 you know the seriously advanced technologies that that I as a business person cannot put my money into yet, mm -hmm. um, and bring it a little bit closer to the point where oh hey I, I I can I can see some use for that technology now I I, I can I know what to do with it now hmm. I can take that risk. Can we can we get there though? Do you think that would that's even possible? I mean, we've got NASA. NASA is a political tool at this point, just inside the U.S. <laughs> right? I mean, it's a, it's a jobs program for a lot of senators. Um, yeah, it it is. Um, yeah, well, I'm not faulting NASA. I'm just saying that well, NASA, welfare that's, for aerospace. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a great way. To put I, it. I hate to say it, but that well, that that is is what we're seeing right now. I mean, that's. Um, can we get out of that though? Can we can we break from those shackles? Um, one way or another, yes. Um, we may not like how it goes about it. I mean, we may end up without a NASA at all. all. I, I, I don't feel like that's good, though. I mean, that, I, I don't that think that's good, good because that means that Elon and myself and um, and and yeah, actually, the folks at ULA um, are all going to be stuck footing our own bill, taking risks that maybe the market really doesn't want us to take, but we're going to go ahead and take anyway because well, you know Elon Elon will do whatever he wants to do. Uh, <laughs> Well, he has the means to do it at this and, point. And he has the means to do it. Um, I don't have all the means to do it, but you should talk to some of my, uh, the rest of my management team who occasionally complain that I'm not manageable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, an interesting takeaway, because we in the space industry so, sometimes get so caught up on, well, you know, NASA's the big enemy, or ULA's the big enemy, or New Space is the big enemy. But at the end of the day, we all need each other, it sounds like. Well, you so, know, we, we need a NASA, and we do kind of need all of these companies to work together, and entities to work together, if we do want to advance out into stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've done some, some interesting studies on advancing some exploration, um, you know, figuring out, okay, hey, we can actually do this for a much lower cost, it doesn't have to be you know, billions of dollars to, for example, send humans back to the moon. Um, now, some of those studies I've done were, hey, I need an Atlas V, I need a Falcon Heavy, 
Um, I need some technologies that um, you know th that my company has been developing. I need some I need some technologies that I, I know exist at JPL and at uh, Johnson Space Center. Um, and I know that you know we can bring all the. I mean, well, we actually have a name for it. It's called Zeus. Um, with an X. <laughs> with an X. Yep. X E U S. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I believe I talked about it on this show the last time I was yep. on. Um, you know, and that required that required NASA, it required ULA, it required SpaceX, um, and we were actively talking to everybody. I think I don't think we actually were talking to SpaceX at that point. Um, I don't think we have talked to SpaceX about it, but everybody else, we we you know have all have had in the same room and and we're on telecons on a regular basis for a long time, figuring out how do we make this work. Um, and I would love to get that going again because it was right at the end. We said, hey. It would be really nice if we had Falcon Heavy to support this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, going to, to one other part of that question, which at, at the end, basically it was, should we do the moon or Mars? And you had mentioned before the show, um, almost neither. Um, you should do it all. Um, no, and don't stop there. And, and you had a very good phrase, and I don't remember what it was. It was uh, like, explore the galaxy. Or... So, well, I mean, you know, if you see me on Twitter, you know that I'm, I intend on dominating the solar system. Um, <laughs> you, there you know. needs to be an evil laugh after that. <laughs> 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 yeah, there you go, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm only half joking, and the part I'm joking about is the domination. Um, you know, I don't need to dominate things. I'm not that kind of guy. Um, but being everywhere in the solar system is, is something I really want to do. The, oh, I, I remember. Um, if you're thinking about changing the world, you're thinking too small. I'm going to change the solar system. That's uh, we need to be going not only to Moon, not only to Mars, but what about what about floating colonies on, on Venus? What about you know just you know sending some spacecraft there and you know spending a little bit of time at that one Earth atmosphere level? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and and figure out what is actually going on there. What is the weather like there? Can we make? Can we build large blimp cities? Floating it at one g, like up, up, floating, floating up. there in the atmosphere where you know you have approximately the atmosphere similar as to what you have on at the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, I think for Venus, that would put you at a scale height of somewhere around 100 kilometers. I think actually. <laughs> So you're, trusting, you're in space and I'm, <laughs> I'm Venus where the uh, atmosphere is the right density for humans. Um, <laughs> well, it solves a lot of things. It makes it, in some regards, it's easier than Mars. Um, other than the floating, like keeping it up at 100 kilometers, so your pressure is correct. Actually, it makes everything so much easier because your pressure is correct. You have a ton of volatiles just floating around you. Um, all the volatiles that you need. Mm-hmm. Um, the temperatures are actually fairly reasonable at that altitude. What's fairly reasonable? Um, I don't recall what the actual temperatures are, but they're not the 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Because the surface of Venus, of for those who don't know, is unreasonable. Uh, there's only been one successful craft there from Russia. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't remember its name. Do you remember? I don't recall it. All. I don't either. Yeah. I'm sure the chat room would tell me in a moment. And it landed, and it worked for like 10 minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, just, <laughs> well, just a then, few minutes. It worked for like 10 minutes, and then it was just destroyed by the planet. And, yeah. and that's all we've ever been able to do with Venus. Yeah, the, but at about 100 kilometers yeah. up, it's a very different very different thing. Yeah, very different. Um, well, I like to, to remind, keep sort of the mnemonic is 900 at 900 on the surface of Venus. 900 degrees Fahrenheit. At 900 psi. Okay, that's that's the surface. That's the surface atmosphere conditions. Uh, Venera, so, right? Venera. Okay, Venera, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that was the that was the probe that we that Russia sent. Um, uh, actually, was Venera the Russian probe? Hang on. There was a probe. There was a probe. That, Look there it were up. multiple probes that uh, went to Venus, uh, uh, but only one, one of one. them. Only one of them sent any information back from the surface. Yes. So, um, so. Uh, but other places, right? So Saturn's a gas giant. So what can we do with Saturn? So Saturn. Uh, so uh, there's, I mean, there's a ton of science missions. Can't land on it because it's a gas giant. Well, what about the moons? Touche. Uh, right. I mean, the, the science missions. I, I, I'm, I, am, I am eager for the next decadal survey uh, for the science mission directorate. 
to see which moons they say are the most important to get get to. Hmm. Um, we have Enceladus, we have Titan, we have um, uh, going to Europa. Jovian, Europa. Um, are all it's, there's some little bit of infighting in the amongst the science community about which which moons are most most worthwhile to go to. So we as a space community need to get to a point where it's not Moon or Mars first, but where it's it's where are we going next? It's it, it's not this or that. It's it's let's do well, let's just do all of it, right? Yeah, I let's mean, do a bunch of them. We should be going out. We should. And there's absolutely no reason why we can't have some astronauts going working on some asteroids while a couple of others are headed towards Mars. And uh, you know, there's a huge group of astronauts working something incredible on on the moon. Um, this all needs to be happening. And really, I, I think, so to a certain extent, I, I mean, I'm going to have to say there is going to have to be a first. Um, either the moon or the asteroid, it doesn't really matter. We need to get um, a propellant depot into um, the Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 2. L2. So, L2. Yep. EML2. Lagrange, yep. Um, in fact, this was floated, uh, a trial balloon floated by NASA about a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, they called it the EML2 Gateway. Okay. Um, it's really nice because if you're going to the outer, outer if you're going anywhere in the solar system, actually, um, you maneuver away from the, the from EML2. Um, you fall back to the Earth, and as you hit perigee, you hit your thrusters, and you can slingshot yourself it out to Mars at like one third of the amount of delta V you need, typically need to go from straight from Leo. So, and these these are like fuel depots out at L2. Is that so? I would do a fuel depot out there. Yeah. So you just you be, you launch your you, you launch your vehicle to Leo. You exchange to a cycler that goes from Leo to lunar orbit. Um, you know specifically L two. Mm -hmm. um, you know you jump on that. You go out there, um, and then you get onto another vehicle that goes from there out to wherever in the solar system you're going to. I just realized some people may not know what a Lagrange point is, but it's basically the, the simple version is you you don't need any. You need very little power to stay right there, right? You're kind of in between gravity so, wells. Yeah, you're, you're in between gravity wells, and you just stay lined up with the other two bodies at a constant geometric angle. So for EML2, you have Earth, Moon, L2. Right. You're in a straight line with each other, so you actually cannot see the Earth from L2. Um, or can you, but in, at, at any rate, <laughs> the Moon... The moon is very much moon. eclipsing the Earth at that point um, from L2. But You'll be at the far side of the moon. Yes, you will be at the far side of the moon. Always. Always at the far side. You, it's the exact opposite problem of Earth. Where you've got the near side of the moon, you will always see the far side of the moon. Yes, yes. And, but the advantage being that you don't, you don't need, like, uh, satellites right now need propellant. They have to, you know, they're in geos. Yeah, you can pretty much, you, you do. You just hang out there. Yeah, you, you, you actually set yourself up in an orbit around that point. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, you just basically hang there and, and, you know, very small amount of propellant to keep yourself um, just circling that one point. Uh, it's a very small circle around that point. And uh, use it as a fuel and, depot. And and technically, year. it's not sec it's not circle, but minor details. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it an octagon? Is it a what, what? It's sort of kidney shape, if I recall. Oh, all right, all right, yeah, uh, all right. It, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of funky, but you know, the, yeah, all, all the <laughs> orbital mechanical details that are a pain in the butt to figure out. Um, so you have your fuel depot at L two, and you use that as your gateway to the rest of the solar system. Yes, yes. Oh. Um, typically, it's a little over three kilometers per second to go from Leo to Mars. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Curiosity mission um, was around 3,200 meters per second, 3.2 kilometers per second, uh, to get to, to, to do the burn to go from Earth to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, with the EML2 gateway, you can actually use the Oberth effect as you slingshot around the Earth and you now only need to do 1,000 meters per second of delta V. And that means less fuel means... A lot less fuel. It means that you can make, either make a smaller vehicle or you can make your vehicle larger with more habitation room. Yes. I mean, there are many ways you can run that, but basically less power required is it yes. better all yep. the way around. And on top of that, you have your, um, you have your, your propellant depot at the L2 point. Mm -hmm. Um, I can do round trips to and from the lunar surface and pick up water ice off the lunar poles. 
So you grab the you grab your propellant because you can use water to create liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen, liquid, liquid oxygen, oxygen, liquid oxygen from your, from your water. Is, yep. Uh, so you use water for that, which we found water on the moon. It was um, L cross, I think that yep. uh, verified. We have, we have we have we ver verified it nine thousand times. Now. We we have now verified. We have now done enough different verifications of water that the scientists may still be hemming and hawing, but every engineer that's looking at it is like, you know, we can pretty much count on there being water. So you've got, we know there's water. You got water. You extract it into the fuels, which means you don't need to bring it from Earth, which means you don't have to escape Earth's gravity well. Yep. Which means that now you've got this fuel depot. You refuel your vehicle. You go off to Mars, and you may even have enough fuel on board. Or depending upon how you build your vehicle, you could have a stage that uh, uses methane that you can use the the material on Mars methane, to get back. I mean, there are many uh, different ways to do that. Whatever. I just, sure. Of ISR. So basically, now you're just talking about ISRU. You're going to have to set that up on the Moon. You're going to set that up on Mars. But uh, no, in sutro resource soon. utilization. Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. I just want to make sure we want. We, so the thing. <laughs> that's, so uh, we're going to take a quick break here, and we're going to do viewer comments. We'll bring you back in after dark, and we'll keep having this conversation. So, um, anyone who's a patron of tomorrow at the three dollar plus level, they'll be able to continue that uh, conversation. And then about a month from now, we'll release the after dark to ev everyone, so it's all inclusive. Uh, but uh, I wanted to point out, you know, in the aerospace industry, we like to use acronyms. It does two things. One, is that makes our life simple because some of these things become long and complicated. Uh, but two, it actually makes it um, uh, harder for everyone else to be kind of part of the in crowd, if that makes any. So it becomes this exclusive club, and we try to not let that happen here because <laughs> this is this is for everyone, right? This is this is for the benefit of all humanity, and uh, we don't want to create. Yeah, the real intention here is is to actually just keep it short. No, of course, right. absolutely. But they, you know, there are there are two Does two two yeah, that. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, comments from our, unless I we, we were yeah we were we were we had nailed that part. But uh, all right, cool. I was making sure. All right. So we'll bring you back in after dark. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, comments from our last week's show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. One zero. Lift off. The fleet of space shuttles are doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back to tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of tomorrow happen. And these are all the patrons who have contributed one dollar to tomorrow. I'm saying tomorrow a lot, to this specific episode. <laughs> uh, and you can learn more information on that at patreon.com slash TMRO. That's right, even a dollar gets your name in the show. Well, right? yeah. How cool is that? Get your name in the show, and it helps us a great deal. We are completely, well, almost completely crowdfunded. There is some ad revenue, but there's actually a Patreon goal that removes the uh, the ad revenue, so it's just an ad-free show. Mm -hmm. uh, I continue to be amazed at how incredible the crowdfunding community is and uh, how much we're able to do, how yeah. much more we're able to do with crowdfunding yeah. than we were ever able to do with advertising revenue. And uh, it, a huge thank you to everyone who contributes to the show week after week. Uh, more information on that at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, let's do some of our uh, questions from our last show. Our first one actually comes from Patreon. This is from Cole, pa Cole Palmer, who says, easy it's for so me to easy say. easy for you to say. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Cole asks, what are the white puffs that look like whales blow a hole coming out of the side of the rocket at liftoff? So in order to get a thrust on a rocket, you strap two whales to either side. Yeah, that's, they, those big that's what those are big on things are on the side. They're yeah. called solid, no. Um, solid so whale boosters. The fuel, <laughs> solid <laughs> whale boosters. The fuels on the vehicle are cryogenically cooled. They're super freaking cold. They boil off at like negative 150 degrees, mm -hmm. right? So we've put these really cold fuels in the vehicle, liquid, um, liquid uh, oxygen mm -hmm. on that particular vehicle. And what's happening is it's slowly warming up and turning to a gaseous form. And as it turns to gases, expanding and creating additional pressure, which you don't want. Right. And so those are pressure relief valves. And so you're seeing the gas, the, the gas form of the liquid oxygen is gaseous oxygen, 
shoot out the side of the vehicle. That's normal. It's designed to do that uh, it's so that the pressure doesn't go too high. It's so like, the rocket's not smoking. It's not on fire. No, and what's interesting is the amount of moisture in the air will also dictate how much of that you're able to see. Hmm. So the more moisture in the air, it's going to look like it's happening a lot more. And we saw that in Vandenberg. Same mm -hmm. vehicle, mm -hmm. but it just looked like it was just like gushing, right? Just gushing right. liquid oxygen. Right. Like it was leaking it or something. No, no. It just so happened there was so much moisture in the air. It was such a weird, like in the air or not in the air. I forgot which way it goes. But it was, it was such a perfect like atmospheric condition you right. can see all of it uh, and at the cape depending upon the season you'll see more or less of it hmm. again depending upon the atmospheric conditions so, so there you go there you go that's what happened there uh, all other vehicles do that too space shuttle did that but yeah. usually they pull it away from because the space shuttle uses liquid hydrogen mm -hmm. um well, that boils off to gaseous hydrogen. Mm -hmm. That's a that's makes big bada boom mm -hmm. when uh, it comes in contact with fire. So they wanted to move it away from the vehicle right. as much as they could. So oxygen is you know oxygen. Yeah, <laughs> hydrogen. So all right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Saying. All right. This one comes from Random Finn. Uh, from the Tomorrow.tv says, uh, I feel I must correct a bit on what Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, was saying about private entities and space exploration. What Neil was frothing about was about frontiers. Frontiers with unknown dangers, risks, and costs. Yeah, so, okay, I get that. Um, basically, this is in comment to my saying I don't agree with Neil deGrasse Tyson saying that right. using the Columbus example because it was private sailors and private ships and all that other French right, ass right. and it was, you know, the Crown certainly did help. It's not like the Crown did nothing. They did. They right. did help. Um, <laughs> Obviously. But what I'm what what I'm saying is that it's it's kind of a combination of both, and that's exactly what we're seeing here today, right? right? You look at COTS, the 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 contracts from NASA, the government entity paying these private companies to do it. Mm -hmm. You look at CCI Cap, which we talked about earlier, which is mm -hmm. sending humans to space. It's it's similar. It doesn't. The Crown themselves did not send out their own uh, military and their own private. Uh, government agents to do this. Mm -hmm. It was private entities that did it on the government's dime, and that's exactly what's happening today. Right. And he still he wants NASA to do it, but it's not. I don't feel like that's NASA's role. It can be as long as we go to the stars, right? Whatever. But it, it's not. If if you were to parallel it to today, it's exactly what's happening today, just not with NASA. And so mm -hmm. we're in a really great position, not a bad position. Right. In my humble opinion. Now, there was more to that comment. So if you go to tomorrow.tv, tmro.tv, click on last week's episode. It was hashtag Apollo 45. You can read the whole comment. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a lot more to say than just that. It, it was a good comment. Mm -hmm. um, I just, um, I don't think it's, I just don't think that parallel that Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson makes is fair. That's fair. All right. Uh, this one's from Nick, also on the Tomorrow.tv website. Nick Cullen says, I cannot recommend enough for anyone interested in the history of Apollo and the missions to the moon, the HBO miniseries, quote, From the Earth to the Moon, executive produced by Tom Hanks. It really highlights some of the human elements along with the technical achievements. It was produced shortly after the movie Apollo 13 was done and to go together like peanut butter and jelly. Totally, 150% agree. Yep. Uh, after you get done watching Apollo 13, which is a great movie, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to go back and watch From the Earth to the Moon, which yeah. is that HBO miniseries, and Tom Hanks walking in those like weird column things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> young, young Tom Hanks, there. young Tom Hanks walking between Quite. the weird column thing, Quite. and and ending all of his monologues from the Earth to the Moon. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit. At least those monologue parts are a little bit dated. Um, obviously, the the Apollo part is you know dated yep. and heavy, but um, and it's really great for uh, those of you who have a really sharp eye for character actors. Oh yes, yes, yes. Because you go back and you're watching some you're of those. Like, oh, stuff. Like, oh, that's so and so, and that's so and so. Tell but, some great stories. But though. yeah, some really what are exactly as he's saying, uh, really great human elements to to and technical achievements in, in those stories. Uh, this one comes from Moon Miner, also on the Tomorrow website. Uh, no, actually, that's from Reddit, according to your notes. This one's from the... This is from... You're totally right. This is from slash R slash TMRO. <laughs> I saw TMRO, and I just said... I know. Yep. And you so, just thought it was you. Moon Miner says... <laughs> Oosh. Uh, you can't pronounce anything not American. <laughs> Don't worry too much. We still love you. It's and Moon Miner, I will say very quickly... It's true. I can't. There's a lot of American words he can't say either. Oh, uh, totally true. I can't pronounce most things. I, I, I don't know why. It is, so we're not... We're not trying to exclude our uh, <laughs> our 
are out of the I'm US. equally bad at English as I am other languages. Yeah. So there you go. I, yeah. I don't know why. I just get tongue-tied, and sometimes I just get excited and speak too quickly. Well, and, and the best part is that... Oh, do it, Donna. You want to say something? I'm Dada because he can't pronounce Tim. Yeah, but that's not true. It's very close to true. <laughs> it's it's, it's close. very, very close it, to true. T- the other thing is that uh, not only Nonely, Nonely is Ben so bad at, you know, his initial first language. Team. <laughs> Team. 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 Uh, that he often just makes up his own words. I do. Which is great when he also screws those up too. I do. It's it's just an adventure, really, being about around Ben Credible. Uh, I do. And most people should just do it more often. As long as you guys understand and forgive, uh, thank you very much for letting me completely butcher most of the words in the show. Even words that I actually know how to pronounce, sometimes yes. I mispronounce. It's amazing. Like his uh, own name. This one comes from YouTube. This is Mr. Dax88. Uh, who says, where can I get this shirt? Please tell me. Do you guys sell merchandise? Uh, we do not sell merchandise yet. I've always thought it would actually be a good idea to open a tomorrow store. Because mm-hmm. uh, I think we have a really cool logo. And I like how the, the whole font's coming together. And my plan is to do that once we finalize the tomorrow logo. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not finalized yet. You'll notice every week it t- tweaks and changes a little bit. Nobody we, we have OK, I noticed. Uh, we haven't quite <laughs> figured it out yet. Once it's locked down, we'll probably sell some tomorrow-based merchandise with cool yeah. mugs and stuff. Uh, and then we'll also. Uh, Hopefully work with some people to get some of those really cool shirts. Did I wear Serenity West last week? What did I wear? Uh, no, actually, it was uh, it was uh, the mashup of The Office and uh, Star Wars. Oh yeah. So it was uh, Admiral Akbar. <laughs> it's a his, trap at his desk, poor thing, with his stapler in Jello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, generally speaking, if you ask where the shirt was, uh, someone in the comments, they're all like Redbubble, Woot, Shirt Woot, mm-hmm. uh, Woot Shirt, I mean, and... Um, ripped Apparel. Ripped Apparel. another popular Those one. are the three big ones that you'll be able to find most of our shirt, both of us, most of our shirts. This one comes from SpaceX. That's uh, shop.spacex.com. All right, this one comes from Callisto. 8413, also on YouTube. Yay. Um, I wonder if Chinese's goal of getting a, a, sorry, I was putting a colony on the moon is for good reasons or bad. P.S. When you were doing your ad in the middle of the show, YouTube was displaying a Victoria's Secret ad at the same time. Uh, that was planned. <laughs> Hi, Hilarious. So I feel like anyone always feels like their intentions are good. Right, you don't. Sure. You don't go. You know what? We're going to do nefarious things on the moon. So, say Some good intentions or bad intentions. It depends right. on what side of that particular coin you're sitting on. So, if you're right. coming from a Western civilization standpoint, I, I can't. I have a hard time understanding what military high ground that actually gives you, other than a, a national pride. Lasers. Right? Le- well, even then, you know, I'll build a mirror. So. Yeah, I, I I don't know either. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know either. But yeah, no, exactly as you're saying. I you know from the standpoint of the Chinese saying that we're going to put a colony on the moon and it's going to be awesome for us and we're going to do all these cool things up there and it's going to be way awesomer than anybody else's colony that maybe appears on the moon after us. And that's all going to sound great to the Chinese and you know any other country might go. I don't <laughs> and it just sort of depends, right? So yeah, you know, one side of the coin says, no, we're, d- we're doing this for us and it's going to be super cool and it's going to be awesome and we're going to be first and it's going to be great. And the other side of the coin is, holy crap, who's doing what now? Who went now? What's this? What's happening? What's going on here? Yeah, so it, it just it just sort of depends. I- uh, Ali E asks from YouTube, is that a Surface Pro? Uh, no, it's a bear. 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 Uh, what's the bear's name? Ursa. Ursa. What's this bear's name? Oh, that one's Ursa. The other one's Bernie. Bernie. Ursa. Bernie. Ursa. Ursa. Bernie. Bernie. All right. Um, <laughs> it is. Didn't it think is, we could do that, did right, you? Yeah, that was. I didn't either. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, <laughs> Applause. For, thank you for our control room. That was awesome. Uh, the Surface Pro this week <laughs> is actually being loaned out to uh, to Dave uh, and Tiff so that they can. Uh, Follow so along Tave. chat room, Tave, uh, so they can follow along in chat room. It is actually Surface Pro. Um, <laughs> I do want to build kind of a cool new set and stuff. Um, and I'm thinking Surface Pros um, instead of the MacBooks. They actually look sleeker on set and they work a little bit better. Um, but, you know, we have other things to buy too. So, uh, this one comes from Untied Music Studio, also known as Vax Headroom from YouTube. He says, 
For the curious and or those with an insane amount of time on their hands, there's an Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. Every transcript, every picture for every mission, including Apollo 13. Quite an incredible treasure, but for the curious, committed, or anyone interested in space, and especially the moon, an amazing time vacuum. And then there's the link. We'll add that into the show notes as well. I'll add a note to make sure that I add that. Add to show notes. There you go. So you can just click on a link because I know that was too hard to copy down in that amount of time. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree. Thank you, Vax. Um, just a great place if you want to just suck in more information, pictures, and cool lunar stuff. Right. And the final comment from our show this last week is Bobbert for him on YouTube says, I really like Ben's idea of a launch show. Thank you, Bobbert. You are a brilliant person. After all, the media generates a lot of hoopla over things of less importance, such as a red carpet appearance or an award show nomination. Surely, as much razzle-dazzle should be generated for a rocket launch as there is over a football parade or a royal birth announcement. I think it'd be fun to have the live audience down at the launch site, like mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy Space Center or whatever it is, have that kind of permanent place to put those things. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, then kind of ha make it into almost a sporting event, right? Yeah. Kind of having the scores, the countdown timer as to, you know, when you're going to launch, some of the information on the vehicle, the altitude, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. you know, wh whatever information you can supplement with it and kind of, you're rooting for your rocket right. almost. Right. The difference is in a sporting event, you've got two competing teams. This time we're all just cheering for the rocket. Right. You're either cheering for the rocket or against the rocket, right? Uh, either you want the rocket to succeed yeah. or you want it to not succeed and you want to see a big bada boom. Yeah. Hopefully everyone's cheering for the rocket or the, the spacecraft or whatever it is. It doesn't right. have to be. Right. Rocket. I think that'd be really cool. I think it'd be a lot of fun, and I think that could actually gain quite a bit of momentum. Uh, and I think it can be crowdfunded. I, I just don't know how much it would cost. I don't know where to put it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of these things. So um, I'll, I'll throw this challenge out. If you guys think it's a good idea too, maybe the maybe not just crowdfunding it, but mm -hmm. crowdsourcing uh, the good fundamental legwork on it. Right. Um, we can use tomorrow as a platform to kind of help build it out and, and whatever. But if someone wants to help, say okay. I'll figure out the real estate side of it. Right. I'll figure out the the building, you know, whatever side of it. Or right. I'll figure out someone else doing maybe the permits, and then someone else doing the costs. Um, we can use the show as a platform to help launch a crowd campaign for that, and actually maybe build something. So, uh, or if everyone thinks that it's not worth the time and effort, and they'll just watch it on the launch provider's website, and that'll be that. You know, there's that too. Then the crowd has spoken, and that's how that will go. So uh, let me know. I'm Benjamin, B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N, -E -I -I at T-M-R-O dot TV. Or uh, since it's a crowd effort rather than leaving it directly to me, leave it as a comment on our website and YouTube, on Reddit, wherever you want to go. Actually, Reddit is a great place. Is the perfect place yeah. to put this stuff. So Reddit slash r slash t-m-r-o for that information all right i'd like to thank everyone so much for watching this week i know it was a long show and it's about to get even longer dave Mastin coming back for after dark if you're a patron plus subscriber that's someone who's at the three dollar or more level watch the uh watch the patreon page look in your email make sure you get those updates from us you're going to see the after dark episode popping over there if you're not a pa uh, pa patron of tomorrow mm -hmm. uh fret not we will make the episode available to you in about a month from now. So thank you so much, everyone, so much for watching. So much. So, so much. So much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>